Solomon, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, and he uh, wrote, uh, I guess, most of Proverbs and uh, the Song of Solomon, of course. And they say that he wrote those at different times in his life, and it reflects uh, different uh, things in his life, but it does reflect life. And uh, after trying every earthly pleasure, as you read Ecclesiastes, after trying every earthly pleasure, if you read it without being rude, uh, wine, women, and song, of what uh, most uh, lost people or lost uh, men and women would say would bring uh, comfort and pleasure. He had a building program. He was building a kingdom. He had uh, power. He had prestige. He had position. And it, it came down to the conclusion, you'll read in the book of Ecclesiastes, of vanity. Vanity. When the average individual would not think that that would be a vanity. But uh, one of the common sayings in Ecclesiastes is under the sun. And so, uh, whatever that is uh, done under the sun, that, that is without God, it's vanity. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanities of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the good songs that have been sung, fellowship that we've enjoyed with Christians, being able to be in God's house this evening, and most of all, for being able to read from God's Word. And we pray now, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you would take the Word of God and make it applicable in our lives. Ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with thy Spirit, and help me to be able to preach and teach the Word of God with truth, without heresy. And as your word goes forth, that it would land on fertile ground and produce fruit in the heart of life, the one that speaks and those that listen. Help us now, dear God. We do pray that wherever the word of God goes forth this evening, that somebody will get saved and a saint will get strengthened and the Savior will be preeminent. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This portion of scripture that we have just read is a description of growing older. And, uh, up to and including going home to heaven. He is actually describing uh, the body and the infirmities that uh, take place uh, in, in the body as we grow older. And it's not necessarily uh, all that uh, encouraging, but it is a reality. And we have all felt that. There is a prodding of the preacher to remember God in the days of youth and uh, to serve him while you can with what you have. And so the, the older that I get, it is the prodding of the preacher to remember God uh, while you can. And in the days 
least that you can and to serve it while you can with what you have <clears throat> because uh, we don't have as many days as we think and uh, young people have a tendency to think that they've got a long life ahead of them they might but uh, you remember that when you were younger you were much stronger and uh, sometimes you thought that you were almost kind of invincible and so forth but the older that we get we realize these things are true the days are coming when we will have wished that we would have served him more and uh, then you can't as much as you would like physically because of bodily infirmities and so the preacher is telling us to serve God with what we have while we can in the days of our youth or while our body will allow us when an individual is young and uh, specifically we would say uh, young and uh, not saved or young and out of the will of God they live to the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the, the pride of life and that keeps them from serving God there's still a lot of young Christians that other things keep them from serving God the way that they should and the way that God would have them and then when you get older there is the fact that uh, desire fails it could be the desire of food it doesn't taste as good as it used to the, the palate the, the desire of uh, the good old days and these things are passing sometimes it's uh, hard to be satisfied any longer with things and even the things that you eat he talks about uh, here in the days of the keepers of the house shall tremble the house he's talking about the body and uh, the keepers of the house some have said uh, the legs or the arms they, they, they tremble strong men shall bow themselves or bow over it's the, the, the bowing of the body and the shoulders they, they tend to droop as we get older the grinders cease because they're few he's talking about teeth problems he says those that look out of the windows be dark and he's talking about eye problems he says the door shall be shut in the streets about the sounds talking about hearing problems in verse 5 he's talking about fear and being afraid and you know that when you were young you were not as fearful as you are now it may have been to the point where you did some foolish things but you're more careful now or we get more careful as we uh, get older and so forth and uh, it's uh, lots of difficulties uh, Fanny Crosby wrote a song about this portion of scripture there's just a, here, here's one stanza that says uh, someday the silver cord will break and I no more as now shall seem but oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. This is Fanny Crosby writing about this because the silver cord is about life and the pitcher being broken at the cistern because it goes into verse 7 and says, Then, or after life, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And you've heard uh, uh, messages at the graveside of somebody saying, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I've never used that at a funeral, but anyway, he's talking about that the body, it returns to the, the dust. And uh, I like verse 7. That's not the text tonight, but the body says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And uh, he's talking about this body going back into uh, dust from whence we came out of in the grave. And then you notice this in verse 7, And the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And it resonates with me. I, I like it fresh and anew each time that I read it. And um, I have used that at uh, some funeral services where the Bible says, And the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Your Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And the particular lesson and message there is that uh, you and I are just on loan from God. You and I are on loan from God. God gave you the spirit. God gave you the breath. And he holds uh, your breath and he 
preacher's hands. You don't know how many days. I don't know how many days. The Bible teaches itself, tells us to number your days. Teach us to number our days. And so it's a, it's a serious uh, portion there. But I, I want you to notice this was the thought with all of that uh, in, in mind. In uh, verse 5, he speaking about the almond tree shall flourish. Some say that's likened unto the hair, like uh, hair going, turning gray or turning loose. And uh, a grasshopper is a burden. And he says, and desire shall fail. Do you see that part right there in verse 5? And desire shall fail. Desire shall fail. Now, he, he starts off in chapter 12 by telling us, now remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, uh, while the evil days, you know, the, the evil days come not. Well, I'm not young anymore. Some of you are young, and it's important for you, but it's also important for me, and it's important for all of us, that not only while we're young, but while we can, while we can. And uh, he says, in this list in verse 5 and desire shall fail now I know uh, I, I'm limited I'm not as strong as I used to be I'm just talking about physically able to go and do and, and you're probably not as much either as you were you you do a lot but you're probably not quite as strong as uh, in, in your prime some of you are in, in your prime, I understand that. But you need to remember this. Now here's the, the lesson. Where he says, and desire shall fail. Desire shall fail. And what I want to speak on tonight is how to keep your desire from failing. How to keep your desire from failing. And I'm talking about in spiritual things. Uh, Ecclesiastes kind of surrounds itself in, in the physical, material things. And then he would say, I've done all of it. He'd say, I've done it all. And it's vanity. It's just absolute vanity. Some of you may have participated in a lot of those things, and you've come to the conclusion that that was a vain thing. It was vanity. And years spent away from God is vanity. Years wasted in righteous living, the prodigal son would say that was righteous living vanity. And maybe you've had some time uh, out with God, time away from God, and you've come to the conclusion that the world is vanity. And uh, it, it's not profitable. But now every one of us can say no matter uh, if, if we have spent some of that time out there in, in the far country, or if not, we can say we don't want to now that from this day forward we're, we're going to heed what uh, Solomon as the preacher says that we would remember our creator in the days of our youth or while we can and uh, we're going to do this in, in a manner so that our desire does not fail so even though my body will fail and my taste buds may fail and eventually my eyes and my hearing and my hair and, and all that fails. By the grace of God, I can keep up my spiritual desire and keep it from failing. And, and you and I must focus on spiritual things because the premise of the book of Ecclesiastes is vanity in regards to fleshly things, materialism, secular things. They, they come and go. Uh, they disappoint like the world. And, and Jesus talked about that in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, about not laying up things uh, or, or not laying up treasures on earth where uh, rust or moth doth corrupt, but laying up treasures in heaven. And it's a message on heavenly investments. Most people are more earthly minded in investing, but Jesus says that we should be more interested in heavenly investments, that they last and earthly investments do not. Uh, 
Notice this, number one, how to keep your desire from failing. And I, I'm talking about spiritual desire, no matter where you are in life. Uh, young and, and us senior saints alike, how to keep your desire from failing. Go to Nehemiah chapter 8, number one, of course, is the joy of the Lord is your strength. The chapter that we read uh, dealt with you and I growing older and losing our strength, you losing our senses, and so forth. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, in his days, they were uh, returning to rebuild Jerusalem. We're in the book of Daniel in Sunday school. In the book of Daniel, they're in the 70 year captivity, difficult time. And, and so by, by the end, you'll see where the King Cyrus allowed them to go back and rebuild. And this is the rebuilding of the, the walls there in Jerusalem. And so it was a, a difficult time frame. In Nehemiah and in chapter 8, the Bible says for Nehemiah to encourage the people that uh, he made a pulpit for the purpose. That's verse 4. And I'm, I'm not going there, but in verse 4, they made a pulpit for the purpose. And the pulpit for the purpose is to encourage the people around the preaching of the Word of God. It takes the preaching of the Word of God to encourage the people. And he did this. And when he was preaching and so forth, the people, they heard the words of the law and they realized that they had been breaking the law of God. And it caused them to weep and so forth. In verse 10, the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry. Now watch this. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. It, it's, it's not the joy of things, but it is the joy of the Lord that is your strength. Now, on that, that same note, you, you keep this in mind, that uh, even though it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength, and you keep Christ first and foremost, it's not that God wants to deprive you either. He says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, things, things will be added unto you. And it'll be the things that uh, you need, the things that uh, God wants to give you, and he gives you some good things. But he wants you to seek him first. And so if you seek things first, then you're not seeking God, you're leaving God out of it. But if you seek God first, then he'll give you the things. And uh, you, you notice this, God wants you to enjoy the things that he gives you. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, praise God for all the things that God gives us. We, we are blessed. And uh, sometimes when we get so overly blessed, it's like the, the spoiled child. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, the Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God gives you things, and He does want you to enjoy them. But he doesn't want you to want the things without wanting him, if that makes sense. And uh, the same kind of thing with, with your kids. It's like if the kid only wants the, the, the gift and not the giver. James 1.17, the Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And coming down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, variableness, neither shadow of turning. And God wants us to realize that every good gift and every perfect gift does come down from above. And so you have to determine, is this gift from God? Or is this gift from uh, the devil? I don't know how many 
times I've said this, and I, I have to keep it in check, and you keep the thought in check with that Ecclesiastes chapter 12, where the preacher says, You remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth. For those evil days come. You, you remember God, and uh, you, you remember if it's a good gift from God, or you consider if it was a gift from the devil. What's the difference? A gift from God draws you to God, doesn't push you away from God. A gift from God from above is a good gift, but a, a gift from the devil, he'll push you away from God and the things of God. And so you could get so blessed that you don't think you need God anymore. Then that's not good. And you realize where your gift came from. Salvation is certainly the best gift. It only comes through Christ. Amen. Praise God for that. Even the grace to believe and the faith to believe is a gift from God. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Uh, the gift uh, to believe comes through the Word of God. He presents the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And then you can make a choice to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Your ability or your desire to teach or to preach the Word of God is a gift from God. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. That's when Jesus ascended back on high. The Bible speaks about that when He ascended back on high, He led captivity captive. And what did He do? He gave gifts to men. And that was for the perfecting of the saints. It's for the preaching of the Word of God. It's for teaching of the Word of God. It's you take what you get out of the Word of God, out of a Sunday school or out of a sermon, and you allow it to help you and speak to you. And then when you go out into the world, then you give that back out. And whenever you speak to somebody about the Lord Jesus and the Word of God, you see if that doesn't produce some joy of the Lord. You get some strength out of it. And uh, then you come back and God gives you something else. And then you go back and you say that to them as well. The witness of Christ, even in the rain that we had today, is a gift from God. It's Acts 14, 17. Sometimes he can punish the, a certain area by withholding rain. And it is a gift. We, we talk about people having certain strengths. They, they use that kind of terminology a lot today, sometimes in interviews or whatever. What are, what's your strength? What is your strength? You take a kind of a personal evaluation. What is your strength? And uh, for a Christian, it's the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The Lord is your strength. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. And by the grace of God, how to keep your desire from failing is to realize the joy of the Lord is my strength. It will produce desire in your heart to serve God and to love God and the things of God, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, notice this as well, number two. I said how to keep your desire from failing. Our, our bodies are obviously growing older, but the Bible says that uh, the inward man can be renewed day by day. Though the outward man perish, the inward is renewed day by day. So the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's number two. Uh, the routine of life is good. The routine of life is good. You need to develop it. You need to stick with it. And it is, I'm talking about a spiritual routine. And uh, praying is a good and godly routine. Now, uh, Solomon, uh, do you know whose uh, dad, uh, who, who was Solomon's dad? David. And he had, a, he had a prayer routine. David was the king. He had, a, he had a prayer routine. And you know this. It's in Psalm chapter 55. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalm 55. King David had a, a prayer routine. Now, he could have uh, changed that uh, routine. But the Bible says as he got the victory, this was his routine. Psalm 55. 
and in verse uh, 16, where the Bible says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. This is confidence in God. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul with peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many uh, with me. He said uh, three times a day, evening, morning, and noon, I'm going to call upon God. That, that's David the king. Without taking time to go there, you understand this. It's in Daniel 6.10. We're in this in Sunday school. That Daniel prayed, prayed three times a day. Daniel prayed three times a day in a uh, foreign land, opening up the window towards Jerusalem. And the enemy conceived that mischief against him to throw him into the lion's den because they knew his routine. They knew that uh, if we make this law and pass it, Daniel's going to keep praying. And that's where we're going to get him. He had a conviction about it. And they could count on him to continue praying even in a life-threatening situation. Look at Luke chapter 18 for just a moment. In Luke chapter 18, uh, the Lord Jesus is uh, teaching us about prayer. In Luke chapter 18, he says in verse 1, He speak a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, I'm not going to, to finish this parable. You could read it. It's about uh, the, the unjust judge and the widow that would come to him and, and, and all of that and so forth. But uh, he's speaking about that if this widow woman wouldn't, if she would come to the unjust judge and get a petition, how much more will your heavenly father answer your prayer? But you notice this in verse 8. It's a very interesting verse that goes along with him uh, telling us to pray. He says in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Talking about God our Heavenly Father. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh or returns, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he find faith on the earth? What's it mean? Uh, you know to pray. You ought to pray. Are you praying? And do you have faith to pray? And when he comes back, is there going to be faith in that matter? Praying is a good and godly routine. And you and I need to redevelop it. Here's another one. Church attendance, is, church attendance is definitely a good and godly routine. Uh, David, the, the sweet psalmist, said in Psalm 122, verse 1, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I wonder how busy King David was. The same was for Jesus in Luke 4, 16, where the Bible says as his manner was or as his custom was. He went into the temple. You, you know that, that they, they handed him the scroll of Isaiah and he stood up to read that as his manner was. That he went into the temple to pray. That's Luke 4, 16. Same for the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. He went into the temple as his manner was. The New Testament verse for us is Hebrews 10, 25, and it means about encouraging one another as you are in the house of God. If you and I want more out of the church attendance experience, then you and I need to start praying before we enter the service. We may again have to turn off the TV because it's filled with fleshly excitement. And when you come to the house of God, it ought to be spiritual. Bible study is a good and godly routine. Acts 17, 11, they were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. Searching the word of God, following up on the word of God to develop 1 Peter 3, 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. It means get a Bible verse for what you believe. Start developing it. I think people quit because they lose their desire for spiritual things. And they gain more desire for fleshly things. Or they return back to the desire of fleshly things. Uh, 
Don't get out of your spiritual routine. You can look around and see that others have done that. And it's easy to get out and it's hard to get back in. Here's last. For the Bible says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. And so I put, keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, keep your eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. How to keep your desire from failing. Remember, it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. He doesn't rob you. He, he wants to bless you. But he wants you to know where it comes from. And be careful if you get something that takes you away from him, rather drives you to him. I've said that I don't know how many times the, the, the main thing for a young person in talking about marriage. I was talking to an individual today about the very thing. And it's, if, um, I don't know how I stated it. I thought it was brilliant, but it must not have <laughs> But, but I said something to the effect that, and, and this was talking to a man, so I was referring to the woman, that uh, if you have to get her into church and to prod her into church, be careful. If she's already got that in her routine, then you're ahead of the game. But, you know, if you are not committed and you're courting, and you see that move going in that direction, so be it. But be careful. It's for a man or for a woman. You have to be careful that it doesn't get physical before it gets spiritual. And I, I'm not talking, you know, just uh, immoral. I'm just talking about that you don't act like you fell in love in the physical sense before it gets spiritual. Or you could be in, in trouble. Now, God can work things out. I understand that. But here, here would be the thing. This is just advice is all. A single individual ought to look for somebody spiritual that would complement their walk with God. And not that they have to, to talk them into it. Does this individual draw you closer to God? And so... Uh, you, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Christ is coming back. How, how to keep your desire from failing is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 9.62, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand in the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It means uh, you've already started out. You're saved, born again, child of God. Don't look back, man. Keep moving forward. And, of course, it's Hebrews 12, too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy uh, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, uh, for, for all of the, the married folk here, see that you encourage one another in the things of God. And then praying for the, the, the single people, it, it's difficult. And I know that. It's difficult. But uh, my pastor, God bless his sainted soul, would say something to the effect, it's better to want it and not have it than to have it and not want it. <laughs> and he was the king of the one-liners. And so you, you must be careful. You, you have to bathe that in prayer. And God will hear and God will answer prayer. How to keep your desire from falling. Man, don't die out before you die off. Don't quit. If you want strength to serve the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you want to be in church, you can be in church. If you want to be in prayer, you can be in prayer. If you want to read your Bible, you can and how to keep your desire from failing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. And uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the desire to serve you. Thank you for this church and these people. And ask that you bless and meet every need that they have and allow us to see that it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And that we don't want our spiritual desire to fail. That you give us the tools necessary, dear Lord, to keep going. And I ask that you bless and meet every need of every person here. Bless this church. Please bless America and help us, dear God, to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.